You're tuned in to RX Radio. Movement prescribed. Brought to you by Prescript.com. A personalized approach to keeping you healthy and making your best even better. Your hosts, Dr. Jordan Shallow and Dr. Jordan Ginta. All right, guys, welcome back. Another episode of RX Radio. Um, uh, a really good one in the pipe today. Probably one of my favorite athletes to watch, train, and compete. Blaine McConnell is a uh, Olympic bobsledder for the uh, American team. He's based out of Iceland. He just casually walks around as probably one of the freakiest athletes um, that I've ever come across. He walked into CrossFit and within a year was on a team at the games. Uh, he's he's a sprinter. He's a bobsledder. He's just an all-around uh, athlete, now business owner and father with a hell of a family pedigree when it comes to moving weights. Uh, a great conversation about misconceptions in training, some specificity around the sport of bobsled, some crazy ass stories. Uh, so co-hosting with me in this episode is Killian Hamilton, uh, who uh, trained as a brakeman for the Canadian national team with bobsled. So Killian is able to lend some insight there from the experiences on the track. If any of you guys haven't looked into sliding sports, they're absolutely mental. Anyone who knows athletes knows that bobsledders are probably one of the freakiest builds of strength and power. Um, a lot of guys are coming in and out of football, getting into uh, getting into push and sled. Uh, his speed, if you don't follow him on Instagram, Blaine McConnell, just watching some of his training, his sprints, his vertical jumps, his Olympic lifts, uh, his his squats, his, his deadlifts. This guy is um, just, and his, not to mention his body composition and conditioning. He's just on point year round. His programming, his periodization is is spot on and as it would be for any world-class athlete. Uh, but great conversation going more down the sports specificity route of strength and conditioning. Uh, you know, he, he, he knows it very well from a theoretical standpoint, but there's no doubt when you see it applied that there's, there's a lot, there's a lot going on behind the scenes and under the hood with this guy. Uh, so lucky to be able to get him to lend us some of his time to, to have a chat. So Blaine, thank you. Uh, we're, we're all pulling for you at the beginning of the season and hopefully into the next Olympic season as well. Um, so guys, check out Blaine McConnell. I hope you enjoy the episode with myself and Killian Hamilton and Blaine. We'll see you all next week. Anyways, man, uh, thanks so much for doing this. Appreciate you taking the time to, I, I have no idea what time it is, where you are. Seven o'clock at night. Oh, okay. So there's no, there's no, Iceland and Australia just don't talk, I think. Not at all. There's it's 5 a.m. here and like 7 a.m., 7 p.m. is my bedtime, so. <laughs> no, there's no chance. And it still looks like it's like 1 in the afternoon. I don't know if you guys can see us, but this is oh. our evening sun. Oh, that's a fucking fuck. That's it doesn't get, in summertime here, it doesn't get dark. It'll be like this at like 11 30 12 o'clock at night and then like it gets like dusk around like one or two but the sun never really breaks the horizon and then it just starts coming right back up again <laughs> i'd lose it i mean I'd, i but then you'd have to have the opposite during during oh, winter and, yeah absolute so like the winter time it'll be like we'll have maybe two three hours of sunlight and then it's dark pretty much all the rest of the time Oy vey. That's insane. Yeah. So how long? I mean, we're just we don't we don't do anything formal around here. So this has already started. How long? Like, why Iceland? Let's just maybe start there. We're gonna reverse engineer this like a like a Tarantino film. No worries. Uh, my wife is from here, so we live in the north part of Iceland. It's a small town called Akureyri. Uh, it's the second most populated city in Iceland, but that's not saying much because there's only. 18,000 people in this town, so. Oof. Now, when was the move over? I moved here two years ago. That's... So just about the same time I was starting to do, like, bobsled and start to do everything, I moved over to Iceland as well. And you guys, and now, like, not to get too personal, but you guys have, like, I'd imagine your kid is going to be some sort of Viking with your genetics, and I'm just <laughs> assuming that you're, you know, you're somehow related to Hapthor now. <laughs> our kid's gonna be yeah our kid's gonna be crazy because my wife 
was is also was a national team weightlifter for Iceland. She's competed at world. She's been to the CrossFit Games. She's been a European champion in gymnastics. Like, and then mix that with me, and we already have a little daughter. She's almost nine months old, and she's gonna be a freak as well if she wants to. Yeah, man. Like you look like you cut out of a comic book. Like. <laughs> The hard part now is you can never get fat. That sucks. I thought that was a whole yeah, point. I, the whole point of getting married was just like I kick back. It's like not when your wife is, you know, gymnast, fucking CrossFit, <laughs> mom sled. That's insane. Yeah. Well, let's get into a little bit of your sports background because I, I want to. I want to hopefully have some time to talk about some of your training principles and stuff because I think it's super interesting the way. Like I think a lot of us when we come up and Killian and I were talking about this yesterday, like strength and conditioning and athletics in North America. And like, you're from Washington, if I'm not mistaken, like yeah, in, you probably know better, better than anyone. Let's just like, it's all football centric. Right. So like you grow up and like, you want to get an S and C and you're looking around and it's like, you know, 225 bench press and you might do like a shuttle run. Maybe you do like a, you know, a, a flying 40 or something like that. But I think once you really start to ascend, like, and you just get some experience, you really start to realize that some of the craziest athletes I've ever met have been sliding sports athletes. Like, be just like the physicality. Like, I remember there was a Canadian dude, Jesse Lumsden, who was like a quarterback and like the, or I don't know what he was. Killian, you, you might know Jesse. But running back, Stan Peters. And he was a fucking brick shithouse. And he ended up like pushing sled in in canada and i started to realize like, holy shit like some of the best athletes i knew there's a guy in ottawa jay nira um we're we're sliders right and just like the genetic i don't even want to say the genetic prowess but like it's it's power in the sense of of strength moving fast like i've never seen so it's always interesting to get people's backgrounds because most most people i know that are sliders have like a multiple multiple sports backgrounds before they get into sliding. So like give me a little bit of a rundown of like how you got into like into bobsled and what were your kind of academic milestone or not academic, your athletic milestones that kind of got you there. Uh, so I played football at the University of Idaho. Um, so I, I, I walked on as just an athlete. They didn't know what they wanted to do with me. They threw me in as a running back. Um, and I'd never played running back in high school. I was always a receiver DB. So they just threw me in at th some random position. And then uh, I bounced around positions all over through college. After college, I played one year professionally in arena. Um, realized real quick that I hate indoor football. It's nothing like outdoor football. And it just totally sucks, especially I was on defense at that point. Um, so I played one year of arena football. After I got done with arena, I went towards more of like the strength and conditioning route as like a coach. So I went back to my old high school, trained those kids. Um, some of those kids went to college and then I kept bouncing back to me. So I had a little bit more experience with like collegiate sports. Uh, and then some weird way I got sucked into doing CrossFit for a few years. Uh, so I mainly because I wanted to learn how to do Olympic weightlifting and the only place around me that had anything to do with Olympic weightlifting was a CrossFit gym. So I walked in there, started doing the CrossFit stuff. And then that was around 2013, 14. Um, and then I went to the games in 2016, realized real quick that I'm not cut out for this anymore. So I went to the games and was just like, I'm done with it. <laughs> I don't want to do this again. Uh, and Dude, that's fucked. Like, I don't want to stop you right there. Cause like you picked up CrossFit to learn Olympic lifting. And then you were at the game and like your games 2016 is like, look, I was in the Bay area with like the OG CrossFitters. Like it was like CrossFit in 2006 was like just a bunch of dudes working out in a parking lot. Like CrossFit games yeah. 2016 is like, this is like the legit CrossFit. Like you, you must've competed against, uh, would, would no, would Frazier still have been around then? or not Frazier? Sorry. Would, um, uh, Froning still have been around then? Like, so, this is so yeah became formidable like that's no joke man like you just glassed over that like you're picking up the fucking morning paper like hold the phone <laughs> like, like is you know what it is have you ever seen the movie the uh, the replacements 
Yes. Really, the awful football movie with like we have to believe Adam Sandler as a quarterback. Like, you know, get the fuck out of here. And the one guy watches, he's just jacked out of his mind. He goes, "Can you teach me to football?" And he was like, "Yeah, bro." Like, <laughs> he teach, like it's like Terry Crews or something. It's like, oh, like what's this CrossFit? It's like, bah, bah, bah. like how the fuck do you do go to the games in two years? That's insane. Well, I went to the games on a team though, so I mean, it's not it's. It's the same, but it's not the same. But I did compete against Froning because Froning was doing teams at that point as well. Um, we ended up getting sixth place that year. So we were competing pretty much side by side with Froning and then some of the other big teams that were around at that point. Um, but just going there, and like that was the pinnacle of that sport. And at that point in time, like I still really enjoyed like the heavy stuff, the sprints and like doing plyometrics and jumping around. And I wanted to just go back to that style of training for a while. So like after the games in 2016, there was a limbo period where I was just training, but not for anything like specific. I was just basically messing around doing whatever I wanted to do. So a little bit of weightlifting, a little bit of plyos, like kind of just the stuff that I like to do to have fun with. Um, And then around 2018, uh, the Olympics came on TV and I happened to be in a room just full of friends and we were watching the olympics and uh as soon as bobsled came on tv one of the guys in there uh was trained at the colorado center i think he trained a couple of the bobsled athletes specifically in weightlifting and knew one of the coaches and everyone at the room almost immediately was like this sport is for you like you need to go try out for bobsled right now i was like yeah sure and then that guy's like i'll get in contact with the coach and i didn't think anything was going to come of it but like three four days later um I get an email from like a recruiting person talking about like, we've got combines coming up in a few months. So I just decided like, all right, I'll start training for the combine and just basically went through their process where you like, you go through the combine and then rookie camp and then push champs and kind of make the team that way. So my first year trying out for it, I made the national team, which would have been 2019. And then this was my second year on the national team. That's insane. Can you walk me through just a little bit of, because um, I'm interested in the combine process. Cause like, I know how antiquated the combine process is for like, you know, the major pro sports. Like you got, you got hockey kids trying to bench press like 155 pounds and their spaghetti arms are failing. And you got like <laughs> just the transferability of most like combine style training and just like, it's just not there. It's just ancient metrics, but understanding that like Olympic sports are a little bit more hopefully scientific based. There's a lot of talent identification, the talent identification that goes into selecting athletes. What was the, what was the combine process like for bobsled? So it's basically a two-step combine. Um, You go out, you do a 45 meter sprint and that's timed in zero to 15, 15 to 45 and then 45. So you've got your, basically your acceleration, your flying period, and then your total time. Then you do a broad jump um, and then you do kind of like an underhand shot toss for distance. And if you can score high enough on that, they invite you to rookie camp, which then you come out to the Olympic training center in Lake Placid and they kind of teach you the gist of like how to push a sled. They've got a dry track there, which is basically a sled that's on like a regular turf or a sprinting track, but it's kind of goes like downhill and uphill and you can just get reps in, go back and forth. So they teach you basic mechanics on like what to expect when you're pushing a sled. And then at the end of the week of that rookie camp, you have a rookie push champs where they just say, go for it. And they want to see who can push the fastest. Um, And then during that camp period, you'll also do a three rep back squat and then a power clean max. And then they kind of use the throw, the jump, the sprint, and then the lifts as like your total combine score. Killian, do we have anything similar like that in Canada? Yeah, so that's pretty much exactly what they do in Canada now as well. Like, there was a brief period, like, when did I slide? 2016. 2017 was the year that I went out. Um, So it's very similar here in Canada. Um, Before that, there was, like, a a weird interim period where there was, like, they were trying out a few different things. Like, they had, like, a front squat max, and then obviously it didn't really make much sense as to, like, a three-rep back squat made a little bit more sense. But we do basically the same thing here. My... My experience going out was a little bit different than Blaine's. Like basically when I went out to slide was the year before the the last games. And, and I basically had missed the rookie camp, but there were spots opening up on the development side. So I met, met a girl who was on the women's team and I was basically like, Hey, it's been my lifelong dream to do bobsled. Uh, How do I go do it? 
And she was like, well, are you fast? And I was like, yeah, I'm fast. And she's like, no, like, are you actually fast? Like, this is an Olympic sport. And I was like, yeah, I'm fast. Like, give me the phone number. Where do I go? So whatever, she contacts the recruiter. She's like, I know a guy, like, he's pretty strong and, and whatnot. And, like, he says he's fast. So I got accepted to, like, the first round, the try with that Blaine went to, which was just the, like, fly 40, uh, broad jump, and med ball toss. And, like, I ran track in high school, but I didn't do anything athletic since. So I showed up at this uh, this tryout with like vans on, like some like slip on vans and like fucking dudes were rolling up who didn't make Rio and like they're putting their cleats on and like it, dudes A535 in their butt cheeks and like I got my slip on vans and my short shorts. I'm like, all right, let's do this. And I like take the tarp off. So like I run this thing and like my fly time was good. My total time was good. My acceleration was obviously terrible. And the feedback I got was that was the fastest, ugliest run we've ever seen. Um, so then I broad jumped it and like pretty sure stress fractured both my feet, chucked the medicine ball, um, went home. And I was like, well, that was embarrassing. Like, I have no idea what I'm doing. And then two days later, I got this email to go out to Calgary to push. Um, so yeah, I quit my job and uh, packed up all my stuff and got on a plane and I, I landed in Calgary and the pilot that I was going to push for picked me up and he drove me from the airport to the track in Calgary. And he was basically, yeah, man, like we're going to push this sled. So put your hands here and don't let go. And we went to the top of the hill and I just got in a bobsled. And that was all the instruction I received on pushing. You didn't even go to the push the ice house. You just went straight to the track. I got to the ice house a week later. I'd already been in a sled like 12 times. What? That's yeah, insane. My, dude, my brains were mangled. Like, you know, Calgary, like it's not an easy track to even be in a sled in, especially with like development pilots, like shout out to everybody I push for, but it's not the most fun track in the world. It's pretty bumpy. So it was like, I get off this plane from Toronto, 30 minutes later, I'm at the track. 30 minutes later, I'm in the sled. And it's like, I was just getting mangled. And, and like uh, Jordan met my buddy, Dan, when we were out in Calgary and it was like, me and him are just both grinders. You know what I mean? Like whoever needed a push, like I'd push for, like when we were in Whistler, I'd push for three, four people same night, like probably go down like 10 times in a training session um, just to get reps in. But yeah, it's a little bit different experience than Blaine, but we have the same recruitment process. Unfortunately, like I missed the boat on the instructional phase of things and I kind of just got the, got the crash phase of things. So that's the fun thing about bobsled though. It's like everyone has these, like Blaine said, it's this unique experience of you're sitting in a room and someone's like, Hey man, you should go do this thing. And I don't think any of us know what we're getting into when we show up. No, you absolutely have no clue what you're getting into. It's insane that you went straight from never pushing to actually pushing on the track, especially because they have the ice house right there. Like you could have got some yeah. practice reps in before. Maybe one or Calgary two. is, yeah, Calgary is not, an easy track. I actually hated Calgary when I was there and it's just, it's rough. It's, I don't know if it, cause the last time I was in Calgary was right before they closed it down. Um, and they were going to start the construction and tearing that thing down. So I'm not sure if like they, the crew just didn't care about the ice as much or what, like it was like sliding on gravel there. So it was well, just miserable. Yeah. The day, like the, my first day in a bobsled was two days after like these three kids went down the track at night and died. So it's like these kids went down on like a toboggan and, and died. And then like the track was shut down. And then my first day was like their tracks back open again. And I'm like, well, why was it closed? They're like, oh, three people died, but like hop in anyways. Here's a bike helmet. It's like, oh, oh man. Great experience. What was, Blaine, do you remember your first, your first go? Like what was going through your head on your first real run? Like, you know, eyes by dry, like it's fucking, <laughs> fucking full tilt here. So my first, luckily we have like, I was able to get into push champs for a rookie camp and able to like get some, some reps behind a sled before actually getting on ice, which pushing on the dry track and pushing on ice are a lot different, but you at least learn mechanics on like what to kind of do, lean forward, hit the sled. Um, but my first runs were at Lake Placid, which a lot of people in the sliding world hate Lake Placid because it's just a super technical, super rough track if you're not good at it. But luckily I was with a really good pilot. Um, but still it's like you hop in, I was so tense cause I didn't know that like how to sit in a sled yet. So I just like pushed the sled, ran as fast as I could, hopped in and then I just grabbed onto the frame and was just like death gripping it the whole time, trying not to move, like holding my breath. 
And by the time I got down to the bottom, I was nauseous. Like, yeah, you, you get super nauseous. Your head's rattling around. You have no idea what turn you're in, like where you're at on the track. All the only thing I was told before the run was the first because in Lake Placid there's like a mini straightaway and then there's a finish straightaway. And they go the first straightaway, don't pull the brakes. The second straightaway, pull the brakes. I was like, okay. So we get through the first straightaway and I was, it felt like I was already in the sled for like three minutes. I was like, this is gonna take forever. And then we get through the second straightaway and I just yank on the brakes, but I'm like, eyes are closed. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Like I was so dizzy, so nauseous, everything. And then we get down to the bottom, flip the sled over and we're taking it back up to the top. And I was like, this is actually pretty fun. I always think of like in every space movie, there's that scene where like the astronauts in like that, that fucking gyroscope that yeah. spins them in all directions. That's what I feel like being in a sled must, must be like. Cause like I have people that every time they come out of like, do you do concussion tests with these guys? And like, they're so just like, have you ever seen uh, 50 first dates? And there's that one guy who's like 10 second Tom. <laughs> like, hi, my name is Tom. I swear to God, man, sliders in season, like doing like the, uh, in her, the world cup tour. Um, a couple years ago, I talked to him and he was like, hi, my name is Tom. Five minutes, like five seconds later, hi, my name is Tom. I was like, oh, shit. But like, how did, how did your approach then change? Because I love how your approach was like, I'm just going to get in, hang on, and just be super jacked. <laughs> like, I'm just going to hold on to everything. <laughs> what's like, how do you survive? Like, what's the, what's the tactic? What's the strategy actually in the sled? Because I don't think people realize the technical aspect of skeleton, of luge, of bobsled. And like, there's, you know, there's, there's perennial winners. There's people who are really good, which means it's not just get in, grip and rip. Like there's such a technicality to it. What's like, how has your approach changed since run one to now, as far as like, okay, this is, this is how I strategically navigate the course. So I'll, I'll actually watch film on the tracks for probably, I'll probably go through it 20, 25 times just to like learn the turns. Um, and then like that first day of, uh practice or like our basically leading up to a race we get three days of like test runs and just kind of go through practice uh you learn how to like lean into what turns you get the feel of what those turns are like so rather than just watching on video you're kind of getting the feel of what the track's like but also like you learn like where these turns are at what turns are hard what turns are soft so you can actually like figure out like how to push and pull on your arms to kind of balance yourself out into the turn so you're not just bouncing off the walls in the back so as you're sitting in like a two man, for example, you're basically folded in half. Your legs are out in front, your head's down in between your knees and your arms are stretched over your head. But you can kind of figure out like if you're going into a hard left turn, you can kind of push and pull with your arms to kind of keep yourself balanced. You can kind of lean your head left and right so you know what turn's coming in. And then in a four man, you pretty much do the same, but you're, everyone's kind of sitting a little bit more upright, but you still have the same thing. Like, you know, what turns coming up so you can kind of like brace yourself so you don't slam against the wall when this hard turn comes in so a lot of it goes into like knowing what the track is knowing what turns feel like and then just anticipating but also like trying to keep your movement to a minimum so the driver can just take the sled down there so as you're anticipating turns what i'm really trying to do is just fight against the force of me whipping back and forth so i'm not moving the sled at all and he can just manipulate the sled as he needs yeah. What I find really interesting from a strength and conditioning standpoint, sorry to cut you off, Gillian, is that I think a lot of people, if they treated their sport like bobsled when they were training, regardless of what the sport is, because like, how do you practice for the actual sport? Yeah, it's running, which is like, I think sprinting is a component of pretty much any S&C program just with force production stuff. But like, when you're in the sled, like I've never seen anyone in the gym, any like any bobsledder I know doesn't go in the gym and just do this, right? <laughs> it's, 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 but it, it lends such insight because the best athletes I know are, are sliding sport athletes. So it's like, look, you, when you're in the gym, like specificity, like leave the shape of the sport to the sport itself. And then when you're in the gym, just work on becoming like a better athlete, be more powerful, more explosive. But like me and Killian were riffing on this yesterday, like baseball, like Killian works a lot with professional baseball players. And it's like the last thing you want to see is a guy with like, you know, a three pound baseball throwing it. You're like, dude, like you throw enough baseballs. You don't need to throw a heavier baseball. Just you should, I think everyone should just pretend that their athletes are sliding sport athletes. It's like, they're not going to sit them in the gym and do this. No. Like you walk your training and it's, and it's plyos, it's sprinting. It's, it's, it's all these stuff. Um, how has your training evolved to, to start to, I mean, fit 
and I'm going to air quote fit because like, obviously the shape of the sport is so different outside the running component. How, like, how have you with like your S and C background started to tailor your training towards, towards sliding? A lot of my training is focused on sprinting because a lot of the aspect of bobsled is sprinting. The way that I view a bobsled athlete is we're basically the biggest sprinters on the planet. Like we're not trying to be like 75 kilo dudes that can run sub 10 hundreds. We're trying to be hundred kilo dudes that can run 10, five hundreds or 10, four. Like you're trying to get to that point. So a lot of it is, is trying to just maintain size through like just regular trying to strength work. But a lot of it also is con like constantly sprinting, constantly working on the speed aspect of stuff. And you're just trying to maintain your power output as you can do that. Yeah. Like that was, that was a big uh, challenge. Like for myself, when I got into sliding, like, I think I showed up at that first combine funny that you say it at like 75 kg. So like the year I got into sliding, like I was doing power lifting, like relatively competitive, but I was cutting down to like 68 kg and competing. And then like my off season weight was 77 kg or whatever. So I roll up to this combine, I'm like 75 kg. I get out West. I think by that time I was like 80 kg. And then I think by the time, like I, I came back to Ontario, I think maybe I was like 85 or close to 90. And I think the biggest, like that, that was the biggest thing for me was like, not only like maintaining speed and, and size, but it was like maintaining speed and trying to gain size. And I'm not a very big person. So it was like, like Blaine says, it's like you're doing this crazy amount of volume in terms of like sprinting and it doesn't always have to be sprinting, but coordination drills, plyometrics, like you do a ton of like jumping and like bounce stuff, which is sick. Like I love watching your stories and your videos because it's so intelligent the way you go about it. But I remember like trying to run and jump and, and do plyos and then I would do that in the morning. I'd go to work after that. I would go to the gym or I'd do it vice versa. Like I'd be at the track at 8 p.m. at night and then stay up for two hours trying to eat. Because if I woke up the next day, I knew I was going to be like three kg lighter with that volume you actually have to incur to see changes in both, right? Speed and strength. They're both frequency and volume sports over intensity for the most part, I think. Yeah, right. Yeah, a lot of it too, like learning how to like use my plyometrics in a way that is going to benefit me specifically for sprints. Because I've always done jump training and I've always done like plyos, but a lot of it has been on like the power side of things. So like one to four reps or one to three reps doing depth jumps or box jumps or variations of one or two. And since doing more bobsled, I've gotten into becoming more elastic with it and more cyclical. And some of the terms of like the, the bounding and the skips and doing that kind of stuff, that's going to transfer over more towards like the sprinting side where I would probably like in the past be doing more, like weighted jumps and things that would maybe transfer over to the weightlifting side. So I'm not, I've, a lot of my plyometric shift has kind of flip flopped over to I'm doing things to become better sprinter versus doing things that just become more explosive for lifting weights or whatever on the other side. What is like a normal week of pro like programming, understanding that like, you know, context is everything, but like right now where, like how far are you out from competition? I'm sure that's an unknown variable, but like roughly how far are you out from competing? And then what is like a week of programming look like in that context? Um, what's, so we're in July. So I would say we're maybe a month and a half, two months from like when we normally would start getting back on ice a little bit. Uh, Mid-September to end September is when we kind of do like our team trials and have like our, our beginning races. Um, right now, I've just started like entering kind of a power phase leading into uh, going into what would be like at the beginning of our preseason. And right now, Mondays, I've got acceleration work with sleds. And then I do some Olympic lifting, um, very low volume overall, basically just doing like some power cleans and front squats and that's it. Uh, and then Tuesdays is more of a max velocity day for me, um, focusing on upper body strength, like doing a lot of upper body strength work allows me to keep some of my size on a lot easier. So I don't really do a lot of strength or a lot of like volume on the legs outside of sprinting right now, other than like keeping just the power phases up with dudes in the Olympic lifts. Uh, so I'll do Monday acceleration, Tuesday, max velocity, Wednesday's a, a break, 
Thursday, I'll go back into another acceleration phase, um, maybe a little bit of work capacity, just increase the volume of how much actual sprinting I'm doing that day, and then have another Olympic lifting day, uh, and then finish off the week with uh, either like just a simple upper body workout or just some sort of strength accessory work to end the week and then just kind of repeat that right now. So it's not a ton of volume overall, but it's like everything I'm doing is really intentful towards what would be pushing him behind the sled right now. You can always tell an athlete with an S and C background because they'll actually give you the intent behind the days. Like, you know, we have the unique pleasure of working with some professional athletes of like, you know, like, Hey, like, wait, what's your program? Like if you're consulting with someone, it's like, yeah, well, like Monday's vertical push, you know, I do vertical push pulls. That's not an intent. Like that's not an adaptation. Like when I hear like, oh, today's like, you know, work capacity, velocity, acceleration. It's like, okay, now we're playing with something I could fucking use here. But okay, like this is the indoctrination of S and C from football it leaves you like with all these like, you know, very militant, like, yeah, vertical push, vertical pull, vertical. I was like, oh, okay. So we got a blank slate here. I literally just want to men in black your brain. We're just going to wipe everything clean. Look, here's your name. This is what you do. So it's so nice to hear someone go like, oh, okay. I'm not going to give you exercises. I'm going to give you the intent of each day. What are your major yeah. metrics when it comes to like carry over onto the sled? Like, you know, if, if this, obviously I would imagine sprinting is probably the closest tied. So if you're, if you can knock some, some hundreds of a second off like a sprint speed, but what are, what are some strength metrics and what are some lifts that you always not keep in, but are like milestones or, or markers for like, okay, we've made some serious progress this off season. You know, there's obviously a skill component, which we touched on earlier, but we should be in a better place to go faster. And obviously your data points only being in this a few years, which is still blowing my mind your data points really aren't stacked up, but what for you would be like, okay, if this gets stronger, if this gets higher, I'm going to be able to push sled faster. Outside of the sprinting. So I'll, I'll time myself maybe once every eight to 12 weeks. I don't like to time myself often. I like, I've always been someone like I can feel how well I'm doing that day. Like I've never needed a number to kind of validate where I'm at. So I'll time myself on like a flying 30 or a static 30 or whatever it may be every eight to 12 weeks. But on the lifting side of stuff, for me personally, I've always felt that the snatch kind of dictates like how well I'm going to push. So if my snatch is getting higher and higher, or if I'm hitting relatively higher percentages with ease, then I've always felt that that's translated over to pushing the sled really well. Uh, and then like even during the season, like I'll do just power snatch. I won't, uh, worry about the full movement but i've able to like the more snappy i can make 120 kilos feel like i don't know why it's 120 but as snappy as i can make 120 feel if i can make that thing fly over my head fast like i know okay okay today's gonna be a good push day or tomorrow's gonna be a good push day so i always use that 120 mark as kind of like my dictator on how i'm feeling for like that particular time would it, could it be an indicator of almost recovery? Like the fact that you can rip that. I love how you use the word snappy because that's exactly what happened to both of my shoulders if I tried to snatch <laughs> much funny. Like, yeah, what happened? Like, I got really snappy with a 120 snap. Um, <laughs> I, I want to talk more about the mental side. Killian, I want to get your take on this too because I don't know if we ever really talked about it. Like, I mean, my immediate response or my immediate question that comes to mind is like, do you get scared? Cause like I would be at the top of this hill, like look at the other guys. And I think the part of like wearing, you know, like when you play sports under armor, I remember when under armor first came out, but like I get to wear that under my hockey gear. So it's like, yeah, I'm wearing like, you know, the Superman tight skin suit, but no one can see it. Cause I have 75 pounds of equipment on like, you, like you're just vulnerable. Like you're just out there in the middle of the fucking cold on the side of a mountain with you know, three of your homies or another one of your homies and you're just wearing nothing. There's people watching, there's cameras and you're just like bombing it down the hill. Like, do you get scared and how do you uh, like attack the sport from a mental standpoint? I, I think for me, like, and I, I don't know, I'd love to hear what like Blaine's obviously take on this too. And it was like the first time down, I wasn't scared because I didn't know what the hell it was. You know what I mean? Like I didn't know what it felt like to be in a sled. So I was like, okay, I run, I jump in somehow we get to the end of this course. But it's like after that first run, like Blaine said, it was like, I had the same idea. I jump in, I hold on for dear life. But like 
I wasn't doing anything to support my head. So I was just like clanging off of every turn. So it was like, once I went through that, the next day we had to go to the track. Yeah, it was intense fear that I had to keep going down this fucking track. It's like my brains were getting banged out. So it was like, yeah, I think once or twice there was some fear to, to jump in or like if you've crashed, I think the next time you go down, you're like, that sucked. But I never had fear in that regard. I think a lot of the mental side came from me. It's like on race day or even in training, like bobsled, it's an Olympic sport and there's really no amateur bobsled. It's like when you're out there, you're going before or after dudes who've got rings on, you know what I mean? Like motherfuckers are rolling out like Don King with all these Olympic rings. And here I am like some kid going to hop in this sled. So I think more of it came from like, I'm going to get back to the top of this hill and I'm going to go sit being in Canada, you know what I mean? Like in the start house in like the private team Canada room, a bunch of guys with rings and they're going to shit on me until I get back in the sled and I get shit on by life again. So I think some of it came from just like, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to take it until I have to get back in the sled and get beat up again. So I think that's what affected me at the very beginning. And I think you learn, like you learn the level of the sport. And I think bobsled's a unique experience for people because there is no amateur bobsled. Like Blaine's pushed for some real dudes. And it's like, at the end of the day, like, it's like sprinting. Like, this is a sport of hundredths of a second. There are ties in bobsled, as bizarre as that is. So when you look at, we, we've said this a million times, the shape of a sport. The shape of a sport, it's like life or death. Like, you win and you lose in bobsled. So I think more of the mental side of fear came from, like, if I don't accelerate properly, if my ankle's not in the right position when I hit the ice and I get that funny step, like the race is over for the pilot, as, especially as the brakeman. It's like, man, if my wrists don't even get into the right position, my shoulders are too far over the back of the sled, like I ruin the guy in front of me's chance of going somewhere. And that's kind of what I always took to the track as a brakeman, but I'd love to hear what Blaine has to say. Yeah. So like you said, I've pushed for some amazing guys. My first pilot that I pushed for, was Justin Olson and he's got a gold medal from Vancouver Olympics and being able to be with him for like my first time on tour. And my, I basically was with him throughout my first entire season going through every track and having his insight of like what to expect for every track was huge for me. And I think it was a very unique experience because there's not a lot of guys who get to have a gold medalist kind of teach you how to go and approach every track. And he won a gold medal sitting as a brakeman in the, the two spot on a four man sled. And that's what I was. So as we were going, like I was basically getting the best information relayed to me from one of the best who has ever pushed in that position. And it was super relaxing for me to like have that kind of mentorship throughout my first season and be able to kind of just be like, okay, it's not really that big of a deal. Like he's just in his, he always set the expectations low for us on like the first couple runs too. He's always like, just let's get after it and let's just go slide and we'll make it down and then we'll get back up to the top and then we'll start making adjustments. So I've never really been scared like before run. I've, there's one time I've ever been scared in a sled and it happened to also be in Justin's foreman. We were in Whistler and it was during, I, th- I want to say it was during a practice run. I'm not sure. It might, I think it was during practice, but we go through one of our first foreman trips in Whistler and we get through the last turn, Thunderbird, which everyone in the sport knows Thunderbird is absolutely insane. I think you get up to like four or five Gs because the turn is just so insane. And I don't know what happened in Thunderbird, but it was everyone's first experience. We just get sucked into the sled. We get crushed. I think everyone was a little woozy from it or just something happened. We come flying through the braking stretch. Our brakeman doesn't pull the brakes. And Whistler is the fastest track in the world. Yeah. So you, you could be going like, I don't know, you could probably be going like 70, 80 miles an hour through the braking stretch if you don't pull the brakes. So we come flying through the braking stretch. We get past the ice. We start running on these wooden pallets at the end of the track. And I'm sitting up at this point because usually like as soon as you cross the finish line, the two man sits up to kind of give the people room behind you so he can get his hands on the brakes and start pulling them. I'm like almost standing and I see that we're on wood and I'm like, shit, we're going to hit the end and I'm going to die. Like I'm flying out of this sled and I'm going to die. We still don't hit the brakes. So we go from wood to like the last rubber mats that are on the ground and we're still sliding and they're still not pulling the brakes. And I'm 
thinking for sure that I'm dead because at the end of this uh, breaking stretch is like a metal gate at the end. And I'm like, we're going to go hit this. And we leave the rubber. We start sliding on the concrete. And then finally you can like hear the brakes getting yanked, but it just smells like burnt metal. And Olsen is absolutely livid because anybody in sliding sports knows you do not want your runners to hit concrete. Yeah. And the runners not only hit concrete, they hit wood, they hit rubber, they hit everything that this track had to offer. And he's just absolutely freaking because these runners were also the runners that he won the gold medal on in 2010. So these are absolutely trash now. But going through the braking stretch that fast and not hitting the brakes, and I'm literally standing up in there just like watching the end come closer and closer and closer. It was the most terrified I've been in a sled. Wayne just head down the Trans Canada Highway, see the sky from Whistler, Vancouver, just <laughs> on in the sled. We we coming through. Yeah, fuck. I mean, there's. I always remember the Whistler track from the Olympics when the guy from Georgia and the Luge, right? Yeah, I think it may have yeah. been. I don't know what turn it was, but like that for me, like I, I mean, I grew up in Canada. Hockey's a religion. Like that, that was the only sport I really knew. Like basketball was just a thing that like, you know, the, that they used to keep the ice warm when the Leafs <laughs> were out of town. Like, I didn't know what the fuck anything was about hockey, but like Clint Malarchuk took a blade to the, sk- uh, took a skate blade to the throat once. Yeah. And then a couple guys was like some cardiac events, like valve issues or something, but like no one's ever died in a hockey game to my knowledge. Right, like no one's like there was that pigeon that got killed when Randy Johnson fucking came over the mound. And kind of, <laughs> but like, it is insane, like that a sport that people like die right then and there. Right, like I remember watching that Georgia guy because I think it was actually before the opening ceremonies in yeah, Vancouver. It was right, and it's just like so. There's like a moment of silence for like a dead athlete, and you're just like, whoa, man! Like that's a think that no, no pun intended, but there's a certain gravity to that that like really i would imagine would like like height like killing kind of said like look the outcome is life or death because you're going i mean what vancouver you have to be going top speed close to 100 oh yeah very close to 100 yeah we went like 149 clicks yeah yeah kilometer an hour and thunder yeah that's i want to say my rookie year someone was 152 ish I've never owned a vehicle. Granted, I, I have I don't own nice vehicles when I do own vehicles that I felt comfortable driving that fast. <laughs> like my Sebring got the speed wobbles at like 120. <laughs> so I couldn't imagine being in a tin can wearing spandex ripping down the side of a mountain like that. So in World Champs in 2019 was in Whistler. And when world champs comes to like your track, the track crew tries to make like the absolute best ice you could possibly race on. Like, so everyone knew that this was going to happen at Whistler, but Whistler is also notoriously the fastest track in the world. So people are just terrified of Whistler during world champs because you've got race ice, you got world championships ice and it's Whistler. So it's like the top three things that's going to make something go fast. And during that world champs week of training, for four men, it was just nonstop crashes after crashes after crashes. And the funniest thing was uh, when uh, Canada's pilot went out there, he had on just like the fattest runners. It's obviously, he's been on this track a bunch of times. He's won medals on this track. Like he goes out there and he dumps it. And as soon as he dumped it, everyone goes out to their sled and starts like sandpapering their runners to make them rough so they don't go as fast. And they're over there just like, trying to rough them up as much as they can. And that's how terrifying Whistler can be for people. It's like, okay, if the Canadians are crashing here, then everybody's crashing. So let's get ready and start trying to make these things slow. And that's like, that's what I remember being at Whistler too. It's like, like Blaine says, it's like that perfect storm of like literally the environment in which this Bob's like can move as fast as humanly possible. And there's that eerie feeling like the first even couple days of training or the first race day when it's like, everyone's just gunning regardless of place. It's like to go fast, right? It's like, they want to see that speedometer like click over 150 and it's terrifying. Cause like, you know, your pilot wants to do that. And if you've ever been in like the back of a two man or especially a four man, it's like, this is one of the scariest positions I could be in during this. Right. And I remember the one year we were there, 
and it was just NAC, like it was a while before uh, Worlds, but like the British team took a huge spill. Pilot's hand got caught like in the D rings. And yeah, I heard about that. Sliced right through his hand, like it separated his hand in two. So it just got wound up and then the sled starts to spiral and it was just like, and then we went next and it was like, all right, up next, like Canada number four. And I was like, fuck man, like this guy got airlifted off the track. <laughs> We, like yeah. waited 45 minutes and they're like well you're still going tracks nice now it's like yeah it's such a wild experience yeah and the thing too is sliding though like you there's no you don't even if you're not getting airlifted even if you don't dump it you're not getting through that unscathed right like i remember being in utah i was in park city and i was watching sliding there and i remember going like you know you watch the first and it's kind of anticlimactic at the start like if you just go to the top of the track and you hear the fucking cowbells go and then they're sprinting and then everyone jumps in and it's just like the first four seconds is like what and then the person i was with is like go down to like turn seven or something and i'd like yeah. you know climb into the side of the mountain and fucking freeze my balls off park city and in 20 feet of snow it's drifting everywhere and i'm looking up at this, I don't know, man, like you guys would probably have a more accurate measurement than me, but it must be, fuck, if it, it's nine, me- maybe 10 meters, it, it looks like a two-story building of just yeah. an wall, and it's totally perpendicular to the ground. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I remember here, um, there's there obviously like all the sliding sports, so it was skeleton at the time. And I, I, you could hear it coming, but what I realized what I was hearing was – the helmet against the ice. And oh, for Skelly, yeah. G-force in the thing. And I was like, what the fuck was that? Like, were you like whistling? What is going on? Like, no, <laughs> it's my helmet screeching. And like, they're trying to pull their head up. And it's like, the bobsled is no different. Like the amount of sub like concussive forces and the amount of just rattling around. Like, how is it that you prioritize in season? Cause I think it's such an interesting variable to have to equate for it. Like, like basically trauma like how do you recover in season like what are your go-to like modalities outside the obvious like nutrition's on point sleep and all that but i think it's a different kind of rattling of the cage like you know someone fucking comes over the line of scrimmage and takes your head off like that's one thing but like the sub concussive just like you know shaken baby syndrome you guys go through it's just like how do you recover from that a lot of it is like, like you said, like sleeping and eating right is huge when you're on tour, um, staying hydrated. But for me personally, what I found worked really well was staying away from like screens after sliding, like just trying to get my body back to like that parasympathetic state. Cause you're just amped up the whole time you're on the track. And like, even for training runs, you're amped up. Like you can't not be amped up cause you're going to be jumping into this thing with no seatbelt and just sliding at close to hundred miles an hour. Like there's regardless of how many times I've been at Lake Placid, like that's our home track and I've done the most runs there. Like every time I'm pushing, I'm still amped up to push because it's, you're, you're just having so much fun sliding regardless. So you try to get yourself back down as fast as you can as well. So like staying away from anything that's going to create an additional kind of stimulus that's going to get you back to that. Like, so no screens for me, I try to get into like a dark room and just kind of chill out, maybe put music on something that's like relaxing for me and just try to get myself back down to like a a mode where I feel like I'm ready to like, okay, get back to like normal everyday activity. So for me personally, it's just like alone time. Let me be myself and like just chill out for a little bit and just be away from everybody to try to get myself back down. Yeah, it's always, to me, it's always just resembles like every, after every sliding session is almost like a, a post-concussion protocol. That's basically Pretty, like. Yeah. A lot of it is like, we'll, we'll do uh, like preseason, like baseline impact testing and we'll have that kind of stuff. And we've got our doctors and, and therapists with us throughout everything. And they're really good at like, just after every run and after every practice, just kind of saying like, where are you at one to 10? And like, you'll give them a number. And then they'll like, if they feel like they need to do any kind of additional work for you, maybe you can go get massages or some body work or something else that might assist for you personally. But for me, the best thing was just kind of like turning everything off. Like if I could just sit in a dark room and just kind of relax, that was what seemed to kind of get me back down a little bit faster than anything else. 
Now, what's the plan with training moving into the next couple of years? Obviously, like we're assuming that the winter games aren't going to be aren't going to be affected. Like, because I mean, most people, it's easy with NFL. You know how the seasons work. There's a championship at the end. Most people don't understand how the Olympic schedule works, right? Like with what it's the like the Continental and the World Cup, and then and then moving into like a moving into like a games season. How, what is what is the trajectory for you over the next couple of years? So, I mean, this season is up in the air right now. They're going to, like our international governing body meets this week. They're going to decide how the season's going to look. Um, and there was, I think, a few, like one option would be a season goes as planned, which would mean I would be back in at the OTC in New York in a couple months, and we would start getting ready for that. Um, option number two is be they cancel the first half, which means there's no races until January. Uh, which I think U.S., we have some sort of like just like in-team competition that they want to do in the month of October. So a lot less competition, but still sliding. And then option three would be cancel the whole season and just have world championships, which would be in Lake Placid this year. So if that were to happen, I mean, it's a huge advantage for us being our home track and just being able to like have that experience and not let other guys kind of come out there and travel and slide on that track before world champs. Um, but uh, like what I'm hearing right now and they're leaning towards more is just like canceling the season until further notice. And if that were to happen, then like uh, the, this off season would basically just carry in into next off season. And we would, it'd be real unique. Cause I don't think that's ever happened in terms of like preparation into an Olympic year. Cause this is the last year before the Olympics for our sport. So canceling an entire season, right before an Olympic year were to happen, like our organization has never had to deal with that. I'm not sure what that would look like for athletes. Uh, I guess the, the best thing that they would have is data on all of us who have been sliding for the past couple of years. And they kind of know like, okay, these have been our top guys from then on out. And I think we would probably get first shot at coming back and pushing again and doing all that. But right now everybody's just kind of like up in the air, waiting for a decision to be made, trying to figure out what we're going to be doing. And then how is that going to impact training? I live in Europe and it's not easy for me to get to the States. So like if the other option would be like, if they canceled the season, do I even go to the States? Because there's an opportunity. I might not be, be able to come back just due to the travel bans and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's real weird right now with the situation that's going on and we're trying to figure out what's, what the next move is. But my mind right now as I'm training is if the season is going to go as planned, because I need to be ready in case it is. So I'm still planning on going out to the OTC next month, regardless of if it's actually going to happen or not. And then I'm still planning on competing in September, having team trials, and then racing again in November. I, I, would, I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a control, very like, I want to say type A, but like, I hate, I'm um, in a similar boat, but I have no ramifications. Like I want to get home so I can train with Killian. Like that's really like the bulk of like, ah, I hate not being able to just, I think a lot of me wanting to travel is the fact that the government is telling me I can't just like, but like to have real ramifications of like, Hey, I have a world cup tour to go on. And Hey, this is like the Olympics in two years. The fact that that doesn't like, I mean, that, is that, is that a stress that like, is hard to manage like that uncertainty or is it like, are you pretty good at compartmentalizing and being like, look, I'm just going to go do the thing anyway. Yeah. I'm pretty good at just focusing on what I can control. Like I can't do anything about the decision they're going to make. I can't help the fact that whether some countries situation is worse than others, like all I can focus on is being here and training. And like we've, we actually opened up a gym during the pandemic. So we've been trying to get this thing flying. Um, but like basically as soon as the pandemic hit, we had purchased the gym and then we had to close it down, which gave us enough time to like remodel everything and get it up and running. But the situation here in Iceland is much better now we're up and running. So like, I still have a lot of things that I can focus on to kind of keep my mind off of just stressing out on whether or not I'm going to be sliding this year. But I feel like even if I didn't have all the extra distractions, like I would still be able to just be like, focus on the training. If you can't do it, then, maybe I'll go jump in a weightlifting meet somewhere do something just to compete and have some fun. I was thinking about doing a track meet this summer here in Iceland, if they have one and just to do something, if the, the sliding isn't going to be an option. Well, you got to be careful with that. You jump on a track next thing you know, you're going to be in Tokyo in a few months. Yeah. <laughs> the way, the, your I'm not that fast. 
Well, it's like, yeah, I'm going to try this CrossFit thing. Yeah, what's this CrossFit game shit all about? <laughs> no, I would like, like I said, if, if sliding doesn't happen this year, then like, obviously it's going to suck because the age that I'm at in the, in the sport of sliding, this Olympics would pretty much be my shot. And if it doesn't happen this Olympics, like I, I, I'm not going to be in it for another four years to do that. So it's, it's all or nothing for me right now. So it would suck a lot to not be able to go out and fulfill it. And it's, I would say it would suck even more to have it end this way. Cause if they cancel seasons and then like, I'm not allowed to travel and like, who knows what happens, it would suck even more than it would be if I just went out there and I just didn't make it cause I wasn't good enough. So I would rather like just go out there and get my ass kicked and just be like, Oh, you, you didn't cut it versus having this like pandemics end the season early or end the career early and just be like, what if, and kind of just wondering if anything would have come from it or anything. Yeah. Well, man, we're pulling for you. Like I've been, I've been following you for a handful of years now. And when it just comes to like athletic ability and just watching your train is just, it, it almost seems fun. Like I was literally going to message you that day cause I was watching your sprints and I was like, are you speeding that up? Like, I literally like, are you like going in with the little rabbit on a, I, was that good? Yeah, when I saw it, I was like, that's fast forward. Like, is he trying to fit the whole thing in one story? Like, what the hell? Yeah, so it's like, we're pulling for you, man. Huge fans of what you're doing on both sides of the coin. And we didn't even talk about like the business side, which I think would be super interesting. So if you'd, you'd ever be down to come back on it and talk shop about like gym ownership and 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 kind of like, you know, building a personal brand and all that. Like, I think you've done it in, in a way that's just, you're just so, and not to like, pump your fucking tires but like you're just such a crazy athlete that like you make me want to run which is like the last time someone made me want to run they had a revolver to my head and that was like of the only time <laughs> like, yeah, i really wish i should get the fuck out of here but no i really appreciate you taking the time coming on um you know best of luck with everything going into the season we'll be keeping eyes on you uh i'll, I'll put all the stuff in the intro as far as where people can find it and i'll really pump your tires because you're gonna sit there and be humble and be like oh well no not really so i'm gonna do that and you're just gonna have to listen to me kind of blow you <laughs> uh, so blame economy man i really appreciate you taking the time to come on chat with us uh, best of luck with everything headed into the season man and, and we'll talk soon thanks for having me guys this is fun yeah. awesome man. Cheers.